shout of praise the wonders of your mighty love my comfort my shelter tower of refuge and strength let every breath and all that I am never cease to worship you I'm gonna shout to the Lord all the earth let us sing power and majesty praise to the King the mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name Sing for joy at the works of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise that I have in you. Worship me with the man I worship in this song.
Somebody shout hallelujah! Well, how many of you are glad Charles Martin came from Oklahoma City to be with us in Orlando? Give him a good God bless you. What an anointing. And uh, I think we need to thank God for Pastor Matthew Barnett. What an incredible word that he gave this afternoon. Give Pastor Matthew a great God bless you. And what a work, partners that you are a part of. Brother and Sister Cirillo went to see the Dream Center. You can remain standing just for a, a moment. You're going to have a chance to be seated in just a second. But I think this is worth standing for. Amen? Amen. What an incredible ministry that you and I are privileged to be a part of. Brother and Sister Cirillo, I remember it like it was yesterday. A few years ago, they went and saw the Dream Center with Tommy and with Matthew and Tommy and Matthew shared this burden that they had for women like that woman that you just really didn't see but you you know what I mean they had to disguise her face disguise her voice being used in sex trafficking and there are so many like that in Los Angeles and they said brother Cirillo we're just praying they had this big hospital we're gonna show you a little clip of it later on this afternoon and they want to dedicate a floor to women. And I remember Brother and Sister Cirillo just tears streaming down their eyes. And they said, I believe that um, our partners will become a part of this. And on, that, on the spot right there, dedicated $1 million to build Mama Teresa's home. And three months ago, like Matthew was saying, it opened for the glory of God. And there are women like this that are being reached that would never have heard the name of Jesus. And our partners, I think you ought to give yourselves a good hand clap. And I think we ought to give Matthew and Tommy and brother and sister Cirillo. What an incredible legacy for Teresa to have a home for women like this right in central Los Angeles. And I tell you, what a privilege it is for us to be in a conference like this. And I'm so excited this afternoon. It would not be a Morris Cirillo World Conference without Dr. Miles Monroe. I don't know how you get to do this, but somehow you get, call, you get, you get called to pastor a church in the Bahamas. I mean, uh, but you know, the Lord doesn't let him stay there that often. He is in demand all over the world. Pastor is an incredible church in the Bahamas, Bahamas Faith Ministries, but God is using him all over the world as an incredible conference speaker and you're going to have a paradigm shift i believe this afternoon about where you are and who you are in the kingdom dr monroe's new book the purpose and power of authority discovering the power of your personal domain dr monroe is a usa today best-selling author you are in for an incredible blessing this afternoon. Brother Cirillo loves this man with all of his heart. He specifically asked him to come and be with us this afternoon. Partners, would you join me in giving a great Morris Cirillo World Conference welcome to Dr. Miles Monroe as he comes in Jesus' name. Hey! <laughs> Love you, man. Sorry, I... Yeah, your mic in the book is in the, in the pulse. Yes, sir. Come on, give God a big hand now. He deserves all the praise. That's a poor hand. Come on, let's shout just a little bit. Oh, I'm not impressed. What's wrong with y'all? I said Jesus Christ is Lord. Why don't you act like you love Jesus for five seconds? Just go ahead and give him a, a big shout. Clap your hands, all ye people, it says, and then shout to the Lord with the voice of triumph. Glory, hallelujah. My God, wasn't that saxophone playing? Where did you come from, man? Oklahoma, huh? Give him another hand, that was fantastic, wow. Awesome, awesome. It's great to see you this afternoon. Hold hands with your neighbor on your right and left. Tell your neighbor, it's good to touch an original. Keep holding that hand, don't let it go. There are 6.7 billion people on earth and nobody has your fingerprint. Squeeze that hand, keep holding it, tell your neighbor, that's original stuff right there. 
Do you realize that you cannot be duplicated anywhere in the world? You have a, an identity God put on you that no one can duplicate. Tell your neighbor, I am an original and I don't want to copy you. A few years ago when I was in university, I studied my master's degree in business administration. I was in an economics class. Keep holding hands, please don't let go. And the professor walked in the class. He said, today we are going to learn about the economic principle of value. And he said something very simple. He says, the economic principle of value is based on a simple principle. The principle of rarity. That was a new word for me. Rarity. Everybody say rarity. rarity. He said the power of value is based on rarity. And he went on to explain it. He says the more rare a thing is, the higher the value. Squeeze that hand just a little bit. This is why gold is so valuable because it is. You're smart. You sound like economists. Diamonds are so valuable because they are rare. rare. Hmm. Oil is valuable because it is rare. Rocks are cheap because they are common. When you can find, when you can find a lot of something, it becomes cheap. <laughs> and that's why the costume jewelry airing in your air is so cheap. Because they make them by the millions. But when you want a real diamond, <laughs> you got to shop at certain stores. So God made a decision before you was conceived. He decided that I want you to be permanently rare. So that you will never lose your value. Tell your neighbor, I am rare. I feel like shouting right here. And this is why it's so important for you. Listen to me. It's important for you to never imitate anybody. Imitations are cheap. Tell your neighbor, I am an original and I have total value. I don't need your opinion about how valuable I am. I'm an original, irreplaceable undeniable completely original and I love myself lift your hands and scream loud if you are valuable hallelujah so the most important thing you should be is yourself if people say to you you think you are different tell them absolutely yes. come on clap your hand right there I am completely different <laughs> hallelujah this is gonna be a good year because you're gonna be yourself in Jesus Christ turn around three times and just go ahead and give him a little shout and give him praise just turn around three times and say thank you for originality My, 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 my. Woo! Look at the original people. Hallelujah. Jesus said, wherever any two shall touch and agree. Let's hold hands and touch and agree right now in faith before we are seated. Father, we touch and agree that you will fill this place with revelation knowledge. That you will invade this place with the spirit of understanding. And you will take over this entire building with the spirit of wisdom from above. We pray that you will not challenge us, but change us. 
Lord, don't entertain us, but transform us by the renewing of our minds that we might know what is your perfect will for all of us. We now surrender ourselves to your will and your word. Thank you for every speaker that has spoken already. And I pray that every single message that was spoken from here would become a part of our lives. Now, Lord, you know I can't teach. I'm so glad there's no pressure on me. Because you said in your word, we need that no man teach us. For you said there is an anointing that abides with us, even the spirit of truth. He will teach us. Lord, thank you that the Holy Ghost got the pressure today. So I'm going to talk, you teach, Lord. I'm going to make noise, you make sense in Jesus' name. Lord, I'm going to give information, you give revelation. You are the teacher, Holy Spirit. So I'm going to have a good time. You go ahead and transform us, Holy Spirit. And we thank you that you will revolutionize our lives today. We lift our hands and give you praise for a new beginning right now in Jesus' name. Go ahead, come on, give him glory and thanks for what he's about to do. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you are here in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. Glory, hallelujah. You may be seated. God bless you. Good to see you again. I appreciate the, the confidence expressed by Papa Morris Cirillo for the last few years in bringing me back every year. I think... Well, thank you. I think it is important for me to always be reminded that to speak to God's body is a privilege, not a right. And to stand in this podium is a very fearful thing because I am trusted by the host of this conference and I appreciate his trust. And Mama and Papa Cirulo are such a blessing to not only one generation now, but do you know that 40 years is a generation? And if you look at this celebration, the 40th anniversary of conferences here, that means that a generation is about to pass this year. When a generation is coming to an end, it means another one will emerge. That means that the greatest responsibility of Dr. Morris Cirillo and his, his ministry right now is transition. 40 years in scripture is a generation. And if you've been coming to these meetings for 40 years, you should be proud to be still with this work. You've completed an entire generation of giving to the world. Millions of souls have been affected by this ministry, and I'm very, very humbled to be even named among those who would stand here. I never dreamt of this. As a young man and a young boy in the Bahamas, I used to read the magazines of Dr. Al Roberts and Dr. Morris Cirillo in my mother's house. And I remember reading his books as a young teenager. God has a sense of humor. Because here I am, a few years later. And so I appreciate and respect and honor the leadership of this great man and his lovely wife. And I hope that we will always respect them. I want to thank Brother Greg Morrow and his leadership along with his papa. Now, this man is a gift to this ministry. And sometimes we don't know how valuable a leader like that is. But whenever Dr. Morris Cirillo is absent and he's present, you still feel the presence of Dr. Cirillo, don't you? It's called transfer by association. He's a great leader, very sensitive man, and I'm very proud of his friendship, and I pray for him and his wife. I asked him on the phone a few hours ago, a couple hours ago, how was his Christmas? 
And he told me that all of his kids were with him except one son. And uh, that son was playing football. I didn't know that Greg had a son that played football, but I'm not surprised. <laughs> Are you surprised? Anybody big as that should play football. <laughs> Give him another hand. He's a great blessing. I love him. God bless you. What an awesome man. Thank God for all the pastors and the associate ministers who are here today from different churches. It's great to be on the platform with such distinguished leaders. Some of them are from Monterrey, Mexico. We have been many times to speak. And I also appreciate all the leaders that are here in your position in, a, in the church. God bless you. Business people who are here, thank you so much for coming. And uh, this session, I couldn't wait to get here because we're going to talk about one of the most important subjects in the world. We're going to talk about kingdom authority. I want you to get a Bible and a notebook, take some notes. I want to wish all of you a happy new year. Welcome to 2011. Every year I seek the Lord to give me some direction as to what we must focus on in our work, in our ministry, in the church, and our networks around the world. And every year God always gives me a very clear definition of what he wants to focus on. Millions of people look to our ministry for leadership, so I try not to miss God. And these are the three words God spoke to me about 2011. He said, this is the year of kingdom citizenship authority. Say that with me. Kingdom citizenship authority. If we understand it, we will change the way we live. And before I get into this session, I want to bring you greetings from the Bahamas. Of course, you know God lives in the Bahamas. I know God visits your state very often, but he always comes back home to the Bahamas. You know that. And why do I always go back to the Bahamas? Because that's where God lives. Isn't that nice? Eat your heart out, those from Canada. If you're from New York, God bless you anyhow. I saw the snow on the television. I said, Father, I thank you that you live in the Bahamas. So please come and join me in the Bahamas this year and visit one of our conferences and be a part of what's going on where God lives. Uh, by the way, uh, whenever you pray in any other country, it's a long distance call. But when you pray in the Bahamas, it's a local call. <laughs> That's why Jesus hung up with fishermen. He loved the beach. <laughs> That's a revelation. Write that down. Yeah. It's a real privilege for me to be here. And I'm really grateful to see you again. And I also bring you greetings from my family. This is my family. My wife and I have two beautiful children. Both of them are leaders working and changing the world. And while you're clapping, please meet my wife. She's here with me. Sweetheart, please stand up and turn around. Let them see what a woman looks like that is married to a handsome man. This is Ruth, my darling wife. For 31 years of marriage this year, give God a hand for a beautiful, wonderful woman. She's a powerful teacher and a great leader and the mother of my only two kids on the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. And she took away my virginity at age 25. Mm -hmm. Hey, boys, it's possible to be clean. Praise God. Clap, I dare you. I love this woman with all my heart and my liver and my lungs and my pancreas and everything within me. She's my best friend and my partner. 
a wonderful mother, a fantastic lover, a fan beautiful spiritual partner. Both of us founded the church together, and I, I plan to die with her. That's my plan. We're going to die together. Praise God. So thank God for her. Uh, I also want to say that the subject of authority in the kingdom is one that I have been focusing and studying on for the last 28 years. But the Lord has finally released me to write this subject. It has just been released a few days ago in 30,000 bookstores in America. It's one of the most important subjects I've ever written on. The book sold out within four days. It's in a second printing already. Walmart ordered so many thousands of them, we were shocked. And we just had enough to bring a few here. If you read this book in the next two weeks, your entire year will change. I'm going to show you the secrets today to the power of authority. I'm going to help you understand for a few minutes why Jesus Christ came to earth, not just to bring change and to help us overcome crisis, but he also came to earth to teach us the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is about a government and a country. And I want to encourage you to study the kingdom of God. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And everything that you need will be what? Added unto you. So the seeking you should have in your life is for the kingdom. We have millions of books out there on the kingdom around the world today. We got a few here at the conference. I want to recommend you read them carefully. They come in order. There are six books on the kingdom now in the whole study of the kingdom. I encourage every pastor to get copies. I've had so many people who said to me that once they've read the books, they couldn't go back to their churches. And it's because once your eyes are open, you can't close them. So here's my point, pastors. Don't let your members read the books before you. I am always a student. I must stay ahead of the people that follow me. Write this down, men and women. Write it down. You cannot lead from behind. What did I say? That means you should always be studying more than your members reading more than your members, learning more than your members, because you cannot lead people who know more than you. You cannot teach what you do not know. So I encourage you to make sure you are always a student. As a matter of fact, the word student in the Greek language is the same word we translate as disciple. Disciple means student. So the power of understanding the kingdom of God has to do with understanding the authority of God and how it works out in your life. And this book deals with discovering not only the authority of God, but also discovering your personal authority. The secret of my life is when I discovered my personal authority. I was born in 1954. I was born in the Bahamas in a wooden house on four rocks in an island that is seven miles wide and 21 miles long. I was born in the poorest part of that island called Bainstown Village. I was born in a wooden house with 11 children, one mother, one father. That's 13 in a house with two bedrooms. My mother and father slept in one room and my seven sisters slept in the other room. I slept on the floor with my other three brothers. Because we had to learn how to live by faith. And that book is what I talked about in my experience with how to, how to leave from sleeping on the floor. Today I arrived here in my own aircraft. And I say that just to show you that you can start sleeping on the floor with roaches and rats and end up 40,000 feet in the air. Tell your neighbor it's possible.
I still live on that island, seven miles wide, which means you don't need to leave your country to become great. God's authority works anywhere. And I am the living testimony that none of your excuses will be accepted. God loves to begin things in mangers. And so if you were born in a situation that is not the best and disadvantaged, you are qualifying yourself to be a king and queen today. You are on your way to greatness. Tell your neighbor, you ain't saying nothing yet. Everybody say God's authority. Say it loud. Say it again. I want to speak to you for this next few minutes, therefore, on rediscovering the kingdom concept of authority. Write it down. Rediscovering the kingdom concept of authority. I want to focus today on understanding the power and the protection of submission to authority. The power of authority and the protection of it. Authority protects you. And before I get into the heart of this, I want to just remind you that every time there's a new year, there's an opportunity for you to change. And I believe God is calling us to a higher level of greater experience with him this year. As a matter of fact, a new year gives you a number of opportunities. Let me write them for you. Number one, a new year is an opportunity to re redefine your purpose in life. Stop, sit down again, and think, why was I born? Why? Because you might be off course. Secondly, a new year gives you opportunity for you to redefine your purpose and your priorities. Are you doing the most important things in life or are you stuck with the urgent things in life? Things that are urgent may not necessarily be important. A new year also gives you opportunity to redefine your life's vision. Where are you going? What is your definition of your destiny? A new year gives opportunity for you to also reestablish what I call worthwhile goals. Some goals are not worth your while. You've got 12 months in a fresh new year and the question is, what are you planning to do with the next 12 months? What are the specific things you have identified that are important to you that you want to accomplish this year? And number five, a new year gives an opportunity for all of us to bury the past and focus and move into a new future. Thank God for new years. What I love about time is that time always comes in three stages. Past, present, and future. What I love about time is that time comes in three doses. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Thank God for that. As a matter of fact, time, when it passes, is one of the greatest gifts God ever gave us. Here is what Paul says about time. Paul says, awake from your sleep. By the way, he was talking to folks who were awake physically. You can be sleepwalking for 40 years. He said, awake, you who sleep. Second word, arise. <laughs> How many of you ever lie in your bed and you wake up but you don't arise? 
We do it all the time. We, we wake up, but we don't move. Paul said, don't just wake up, get up. Wake up means to become aware of your life. What am I doing? Where am I going? What am I focusing on? What am I using my talents, my time, my energy on? Wake up to what's happening in your life. And then he says, get up. Do something about it. His third instruction is what? And Jesus will shine on you. Christ doesn't shine until you wake up and get up. Awake means you have to initiate your awareness. Arise means you have to act on what you want to achieve. And then Christ will arise and shine his light so you can see and be exposed to what you need to do. And then he says, walk. Walk away from the bed of life. The old one that you've been living in. A new year forces you to think. Am I going to live in the same rut as I did last year? Or am I going to rise and get up? Here's the verse that blew my mind. Next verse says, redeeming the time. Because what? The days are evil. Paul says, are you using your time properly? Write the word redeem down. Redeeming your time. Don't be foolish, he says, and understand what the will of God is for your life. Do not be drunk with wine or marijuana or cocaine. Don't waste your life doing things that destroy your time. And then he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Everybody say redeem. redeem. Write the word redeem down. The word redeem is a word we need to understand. The word redeem actually means to own, to repossess something that you had. Redeem means to own something twice, to take control of it again. Redeem your time means to control your time again. That means other people being controlling your life. Redeeming the time means you repossess the management of your own life because life is time and time is life. And when we talk about life on earth, I am here to tell you that you were sent to this earth to dominate this earth for the kingdom of God. Your purpose of being here on earth is to be God's representative on planet earth from heaven. So I want to remind you that the Bible is really about a country. It's about a state, a state called heaven. Heaven is a country. It's invisible. It's supernatural. But it's the first country that ever existed. It is the country you came from, but you forgot. <laughs> and this country is called the kingdom of heaven. A kingdom is not a religion. A kingdom is a country. I was born in one in 1954. I lived in a kingdom until 1973. Most of my life was brought up worshiping a king and a queen. I understand the Bible when it talks about a king. And a kingdom is a state. And all kingdoms expand. Why do kingdoms expand? Because the power of a king is territory. Can you write that down? What did I say? Kings get their power from territory. I'm giving you something you don't know because you're born in democracy. When democracy expands, it is called occupation. When a kingdom expands, it is called colonization. Two different words. When a kingdom expands, its glory expands, its power expands. And so the kingdom of God is a country but it's a kingdom. 
And God ruled the entire invisible world. He created it and he ruled it. Heaven is the nation of God. He made it, created it. He filled it with angels, seraphims and cherubims. It's a powerful country. It is so wealthy that the country uses gold as asphalt. Come on, you all wake up, get this here. When John went to visit the country, John was shocked. The country uses pearls for gates. Some of you want to go to heaven. You don't want to go to heaven yet. If you go to heaven, you, you become a thief. Why? I can see you right now with a pickaxe on God's road. Mm. 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 This is my piece. This is my piece. Move. Stealing God's gold from the road. God wants to prosper you now so you won't be shocked when you go to heaven. Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. When poor people go into a rich building, they are overwhelmed. Wow. Ooh. I've heard people say, when I get to heaven, I want to see Jesus. Mm -mm. When you get it, you can go. Ooh. 50 years pass. Ooh. 100 years. If lack is your culture, plenty will destroy you. It's too deep. That's why God wants to bless you right now. God's going to make you debt free because he don't want you to be used to debt. Heaven is a country. And the foundation of all countries is constitutional law. This book in your hand called the Bible is God's constitution. It contains God's laws. And that's why when Christ came, he came to restore the country of heaven on earth. You know, the Bahamas where I was born was a colony of a kingdom for 294 years. This is why every morning I woke up, I had to sing to a king and queen every morning as a kid. We were colonized by the European kingdom called Great Britain. And when they took over our islands and they colonized us, we became just like them. That's why we speak English, you know, jolly well old chap fellow. <laughs> of course, you know. That's why we drive on the left-hand side of the street in the Bahamas. Because our kingdom drives on the left. That's why we drink tea four times a day in the Bahamas. Because in our kingdom, the king drinks tea four times a day. Afternoon tea is a national culture. As a child, when I was growing up, you stop and have tea at 3 o'clock every day. Because whatever the king does, the colony does. We had to wear suits with ties in 95 degrees. Why? Because our king wore ties. Whatever a kingdom does, the colony does. Whatever happens in the colony happens in the kingdom. The colony becomes just like the kingdom. And heaven is a kingdom. And God made earth to be a colony. The Bible is about colonization. God's intent was to transfer the culture of the invisible heaven to the visible planet Earth. How did the Bahamas become colonized? Listen carefully. The King of England, over 294 years ago, sent over 300 white British citizens from England to live in our island. And they sent a man who came from the inner courts of England in the Queen and King's courts 
to live with those 300, he was called the governor. And the reason why they sent over 300 people to live in our island, because they say that wherever there are 300 people, you can create a culture. So if your church is 300 people, the nation around you should change. And when they came, they brought with them their attitudes, their culture, their dress, their food, their tea, their chocolate bars. They bought their driving on the left. They bought their cucumber sandwiches with butter. Yuck. <laughs> they bought their English pudding. They bought their black pudding, dried blood. Yuck. And within 40 years, we were just like them. Hmm. God did the same thing because he's the first kingdom he created the heavens that's where he lives and the earth and God created his own children who came out of him put them in an earth suit called a body and put them on the planet and says have dominion dominate the place until it looks just like heaven You didn't come from earth, you were sent to earth. <laughs> in the Garden of Eden, that's why there was no worship in the Garden of Eden, none. No songs, no prayer meetings, no apostles, no prophets, no evangelists, no teachers, no choirs were in that place. There was no apostle, no prophet, no evangelist, no pastor, no reverend, no intercession, nothing in the place. And the Bible says, this is good. I know you're in shock, but hang on for a second. The Bible says there was so much of heaven's culture on earth at that time that Adam didn't have to invite God's presence. It says Adam walked and talked with God in the cool of the day as if a man speak it to his friend. Hmm. Apostles and prophets, evangelists and teachers, deacons and elders, choirs and singers, prayer meetings and worship services are all products of the fall. That's why God promised us that prophecies shall cease. <laughs> Preaching shall cease. Why? Because the kingdom is coming back. Come on, somebody hit your neighbor and say, it's coming back. Now tell them, it's here already. Glory, hallelujah. When Adam fell, he lost a country not a religion he lost a government not a ritual when Adam fell he lost an entire administration he didn't lose some religious system that's why when the Bible says Christ would come he's coming with the government upon his shoulders not a government the government upon his shoulders he's bringing back what Adam lost the entire kingdom administration can I hear an amen somewhere so when Christ came to earth his message was very clear he says as you go preach what this message what's the message the kingdom of heaven has arrived Matthew 12 28 he says but if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God then the country of heaven has come back to earth look at the scriptures he didn't say it was coming he said it's here every miracle is a sign that the culture of heaven has arrived 
Only the smart ones will hear me now. Let me say it again. Miracles are evidence of the culture of heaven on earth again. When I came to this building, I brought the culture with me. That's why while I speak for the next 30 minutes, the disease in your body can have a problem with me because I bring the culture of heaven, which is a culture of healing, and your high blood pressure and all of your diabetic problems are going to come out of your body while I speak. Lift your hands and begin to receive your miracle. Healings are normal where the presence of the kingdom arrives. Matthew 13, 11 says what? The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to those outside. I'm going to give you some secrets, he says, on how to live in my country while you are on earth. <laughs> that means if you live under God's government now, you live under a different economy. So your neighbor will, will actually be suffering and you'll be in prosperity. Because you know some secrets. <laughs> so that's why the Bible says a thousand will fall at your right and ten thousand at your left. But your house will be secure in 2011. You place your house under the kingdom of God's government and it becomes unique. Matter of fact, what did Jesus preach? Look at Matthew 4, 23. Read out loud. And Jesus went about preaching in their synagogues, what? The good news of the kingdom and healing every disease among them, the people. Now notice it says he preached the kingdom first and then he healed every disease. When you read the Bible, when you go home, check the four gospels. Christ never healed first. He always preached the kingdom first. Then he healed all the diseases. He declared a country first then he proved the culture was present <laughs> the kingdom is here here's proof he says look at this one Matthew 5 verse 3 blessed are those who are spiritually bankrupt those who are malnutrition spiritually he says rejoice why because the kingdom of heaven has arrived what you've been looking for what you hunger for he says has arrived and it's not a religion it's a kingdom because that's what you lost Matthew 6 33 says what but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness all of these things shall be added to you therefore do not worry about your life or tomorrow why the kingdom has everything in it Everybody's the authority. A kingdom is not a religion. It is a nation ruled by a king. A kingdom is not a democracy. You can't vote a king into power. You can never vote Jesus out of power. He's a king. Kings are born kings. Number three, the most important principle in a kingdom is obedience. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. The most difficult word in the American culture is the word obedience. We hate that word. As a matter of fact, democracy fights against the word obedience. Democracy encourages you to discuss things, argue things, question things. And that's why you're having difficulty living under Jesus. Are you sure you want me to talk about authority before I go? In a kingdom, you don't negotiate with a king. In a kingdom, you don't discuss things with a king. You obey. But you've been taught to question authority, not obey authority. So when God says, give $5,000, you question him, argue with him, discuss it. God said, look, just do it. But our mindset is our problem. Obedience is the most powerful force in a kingdom. Because in a kingdom, when you obey, you are protected.
Write this down, please. Obedience positions a citizen for success. This year, God wants less arguments and more obedience. Authority requires obedience. Why? Because the words of a king is law. In a kingdom, when a king speaks, whatever he says becomes law. This is why kings don't talk a lot. Anybody here? You keep wondering why God wouldn't speak to you. Still ain't getting this. The reason why God doesn't talk a lot is because whatever he says becomes a law. Oh, I need two more days to talk. This is why you always want to be in the presence of a king. Because you want him to talk to you. When a king talks to you, he just created a law. So being in the presence of a king is the most powerful position you could have. Because when he speaks to you, it becomes a law. <laughs> and a king's law can never be broken. Let me give you an example. Nehemiah was the smartest guy in the Old Testament. He knew, if I could just be in the king's presence every day, he might talk to me. So Nehemiah decided to just serve the king drinks. Y'all still ain't get this yet. The Bible says in the presence of the Lord, there is what? Fullness of joy and what else? Pleasures for everything you need. But you got to get in his presence. Ooh, Lord. And Nehemiah was hanging around serving drinks for years, hoping the king one day would talk to him. The closer you get to God, he mightn't say nothing, but just stay there. Just stay there. One day he's going to say something. Glory, hallelujah. And one day the king said to Nehemiah, why are your continents so sad? Oh, the king's talking now. Nehemiah says, because my city is full of violence. Crime is everywhere. The walls are broken down. The crisis is destroying the economy. <laughs> and the king said, what do you want? <laughs> say, Lord, say that to me this year. Yeah. But I feel like shouting all the way in the back there. You want God to say to you, what do you want? Because whatever you answer, he's about to make a law. Woo! Nehemiah says, O king, live forever. I beg that I may go and return to my city and rebuild the walls, and restore his grounds, and give order back to the city, and the king says, you got it. The king says, now you go to my forest, take the wood. You go to my pit, get the tar. You go to my quarry, get the stone. You go to my hemp, and get the nails. And you build your city. He says, now here's papers. These are laws. If anyone tries to stop you, you show them my authority. I got a feeling God's about to talk to somebody today and no one can stop what's about to happen to you in 2011. Somebody shout hallelujah. When a king speaks, it becomes law. But only people who understand authority and obedience understand that. Do you remember the centurion? He said, look, you are a king, so you ain't got to go nowhere. All you got to do is say something. I 
I came to this conference for a few minutes to give you an instruction from him. And no one will stop it if you accept it. Submission to law is the key to success. Because the king will speak to those who are submitted. Let me give you something to think about. Philippians says what? Their mind is on earthly things, but their citizenship is where? He said, those of the world think about earthly things, but our citizenship is where? In heaven. Their citizenship is on earth. Ours is where? Say it slowly. But your citizenship is where? It doesn't say it's going to be. You are a citizen now. That means that the government of heaven is now in control of your time. It made a promise to you. And it wants you to repossess your life again. This shall be the best year of your life. Yeah. Write these down quickly, please. The most powerful position on earth is under authority. Number two. Authority is the safest place all created things could be placed. Authority is the safest place for all created things. Get under authority. Number three, discovering your authority is the key to true freedom. Number four, the authority is the key to freedom from stress. <laughs> when you are under authority, the authority is responsible. Oh, you're too slow. When you submit to authority, the authority becomes the one with the responsibility. It's when you claim to be your own person, that's when you get stress. This is why when people see a king coming toward them, and we did this in the Bahamas years ago, you kneel down before the king, and then you lay down. We call it being prostrate. Now, why do you do this before a king? You're telling a king, I am completely yours. So if I'm sick, it's your sickness. If I'm poor, it's your poverty. still don't understand it the lower you bow to a king the more pressure you put on him to take care of you <laughs> submission attracts responsibility stress is only possible where you are responsible Jesus said, look, why do you worry what you will eat? Who's, who's worrying? You. He says, why are you taking on that responsibility? What you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear. He says, you're stressing yourself out. The word worry means stress. I can't teach this. Why, why means what are you taking the responsibility for? Next verse, seek ye first. Get on your face. Throw it in his face. Cast all your cares upon the king. And let the king care. Today I announce 2011 shall be a stress-free year. Submission to authority destroys stress. When you stepped on the aircraft coming here, you never saw the pilots working up front. 
you were relaxing in the back. Why? Because they got the authority. <laughs> you left the flying to them. No stress. You're sleeping. And they're wide awake. God says, you go to bed, I'll drive your life. But you got to submit to the pilot. Ladies and gentlemen, the absence of authority brings destruction. <laughs> the aircraft is only as safe as its obedience to the tower. <laughs> the bird must be submitted to the air. The plant submits to the soil. Your success is dependent on your submission to authority. I want to show this to you. Listen, Jesus, Jesus uh, met this man here in Matthew. And it says, the man said, I myself a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell you this. You go and he goes. Come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. Where did he get such power from? What's the next What's the first line in that statement? His authority comes from being submitted to authority. The devil wants you to leave authority so you have no power. <laughs> the problem with the church is we got so many leaders with no authority. They're not submitted to anybody. The devil destroys a headless leader. This man says, because I'm submitted, I can give instructions. And obedience to my instructions comes from my submission to authority. Stay a few more minutes, you're going to get this in a minute. Matthew 9, 6, read. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has what? Authority on earth to forgive sins. He told the man, get up. Now, what was Jesus using to heal this man? Authority. You thought it was power. Oh, my God. Power and authority are different. Power is ability. Authority is responsibility. It's accountability. It's permission. Power without authority is illegal power. God will never work outside of authority. Look at Matthew 10, verse 10. He called his 12 to them and he did what? Gave them. You don't take authority. It has to be given to you. You don't just start a ministry. Someone has to release you. Oh, I'm in trouble now before I leave. You're going to wish you never came here. 2010 will only be successful to the submitted heart. That's why so many leaders are following, falling. They have no authority. I'm not impressed how many sick you healed. I want to know who sent you. He gave them authority to cast out demons. They received it. Look at Matthew 21 verse 23. Read. He entered the temple courts while he was there teaching. The chief priest came to him and asked him, By what authority are you doing these things? Who authorized you? <laughs> Who gave you this authority? They were seeing power. But they didn't ask about power. They asked about authority. <whistles> Listen carefully. There's a difference. The secret to my life is my submission to authority. 
And in America, we've been taught against that. That's why we're afraid to even submit to our pastors. <laughs> Read this verse. Jesus said, I will, you want to know where my authority comes from? This, this is the next verse. He says, I will ask you a question. If you answer my question, you'll know where my, where my authority came from. What's the question? John. Okay, I'm going to close now. But you're about to get a revelation that will change you forever. See, I like you. You understand what I'm talking about. But when I'm finished, you're going to fall in love with Papa even more. Let me explain to you why you are so successful. I want everyone in this room to turn your Bibles just for the last few minutes to Matthew and read a verse you never saw before in your life. Matthew chapter 3. Where did you get his authority from, they asked. His answer was not God. <laughs> when people do miracles and great works and you ask them, how did you do this? They always say, God sent me. God did it. Jesus never answered that. He said, John. <laughs> he says, John's authority was from where? God. Or heaven. Okay. He said, okay, here's my question. You want to know where I got authority from. I'll ask you a question. And whatever the answer is, that's where I got it from. Matthew chapter 3. Are you ready for this? <laughs> they discussed among themselves and they said, if we say that John's authority was from heaven, then he would say, why didn't you believe him? <laughs> if we say it was from man, then the people will stone us because they believed in John. So they said to him, we don't know where his authority came from. Christ said, then I won't tell you where mine came from either. Are you still with me? Okay. The big one is coming. He has a revelation coming. He says he was given authority over the people. Authority means to promote someone. Isn't that amazing? That's what the word means. To promote, to originate, to, to create opportunity for people to be released. Authority means to give somebody permission to function. So what you got to do is find the authority and get under it. Everything submits to something. Otherwise, it's out of order. Fish submit to water. That's why they live. Plants submit to soil. That's why they live. God made nothing that doesn't need to submit to authority. Authority brings order. Productivity, protection, preservation, validation, safety, promotion, freedom, identity, and reality. That's a lot of work. Under authority, you come back to order. Everybody say order. Order, order means you are in the right position. So you can be productive. So you can have an effect and be protected. Verse 13, take a deep breath. Then Jesus came from Galilee. What does the Bible say? Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. 
This is interesting. Then Jesus came from what? To be baptized by? I'm going to say this slow. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, grew up in Nazareth, that's the Galilee, and he lived there till he was 30. Don't miss this in the back there. He was 30 years old. He knew who he was for 30 years. When he was 12, he told his mother and father, I must be about my father's business. He knew he was called, anointed. He knew he was the son of God. He knew who he was. He knew his power, his, his wisdom, his knowledge. He knew it. But for 30 years, he stayed in the house with his parents. Listen to me carefully. Sometimes when we discover our gifts, we leave the people we are under. Discovery of gift is not permission to leave. Oh, you sing well. Good. I'm going into my ministry. No, no, no. You just can sing well. Stay in the church. Sit down. Your pastor gives you one chance to preach on one Sunday, and you preach well, and the people shout it, and now you think you got to start your own evangelistic ministry. I'm getting ready to go. Hang on a second. You played the organ well, and the pastor says, you are anointed. All of a sudden, you want to start your own singing group and go traveling and leave the church. He knew who he was, but he never left. He stayed under his mother and his father. Imagine God being under people. He submitted to them. Now, 30 years is the age a young man must be to be a rabbi. What did I say? In the days of Jesus, you had to be 30 years old to be considered qualified to be a rabbi. So Jesus knew, I have to stay submitted until I'm 30 years old. Otherwise, I'm not qualified to be heard. Please buy this CD. I said some things you don't understand until next week. Because you are anointed doesn't mean you are ready. He had to wait until he was 30 to qualify to be heard. He knew who he was at age 12, but he went home. Now, this verse is very important right here. At age 30, he's ready now. He knows it's time to begin his ministry. <laughs> Please don't miss this. He's ready. He's got, he's got the power of God. He's got the anointing built in, the power. He is Jehovah, Adonai, Elohim in a body. He's powerful. He made the universe. But watch him. He knows that power it's not authority. Listen to me carefully. So his first act, the Bible says, is he left Galilee and went looking for his cousin John to be baptized by him. You missed the point. He didn't leave to go into ministry. He left to go and find the authority to submit to it. Listen carefully. Now, if he was some of you, and you felt it was time to start ministry, your first act would go to the printers and print cards, Evangelist Apostle John. He would print brochures, anointed apostleship, bishop so-and-so, deaconess so you, <laughs> uh-oh, and you'll go around handing out cards looking for places to preach. His first act was to find someone to submit to. And 
And when he, the Bible says, let's read it, read it, read, read this, read this. It says, and when John saw him, John tried to deter him, verse 14. And John said, wait a minute, I need to be baptized by you. Why you come to me? Ladies and gentlemen, that's not true. Do you know who appointed John? Jesus. John was appointed in Malachi, last chapter, when God says, before the king comes, he will send one before his face. Come on, somebody. I'm getting ready to go now. And this person shall be the one who will introduce him. He will be the authority that will go before my face to prepare the way for the king. So the authority on earth at that time was John the Baptist. That was God's authority. I'm getting ready to shout now. And even God himself will never violate his own authority. Uh-oh. John didn't understand the difference between authority and power. He knew this was the all-powerful God. They grew up together. They were cousins. They were six months apart, Jesus and John. They played together in the yard. Mary and Elizabeth talked about them in their presence, and they told them who they were. So when he came, to John. John says, cousin, I can't baptize you. You are Elohim, Adonai. You are God, man. I can't. I'm just a man. I can't baptize you. I get you to say, you don't understand. It ain't about power, brother. Yeah. It's about what? Authority. The words of Jesus, next verse. Christ says, suffer it to so, to be so, to fulfill what? All righteousness. Write the word righteousness down quick before we go. The word righteousness is not a religious word. It's from the courts of law. Righteous means right positioning with authority. Uh-oh. Anybody say righteousness? To be righteous means to be in right alignment with authority. Whew. Christ says, look, come here, stand here. Christ says, John, you don't understand. I got the power, but you got the authority. And I can't exercise the power unless I get the authority. God doesn't care how much anointing you have. He won't know who you under. Christ says, John, it's not about power. It's not about my name and my title. It's about your positioning. I have to get in right positioning. I got to get under you. If I get under you, then I got permission to use the power. Yeah. He said, baptize me. And when Jesus went down in the water, the Bible says, oh, I'm getting ready to go now. <laughs> as soon as he got under John, Woo! stay there. As soon as he got under John, four things happened that you've been praying for and they haven't happened. First thing, heaven opened. You know why ain't no heaven open over your head? You ain't under nobody. If you want heaven to open over your head, get down under somebody. The Bible says when he knelt down, the first thing, the heavens opened. Number two, a voice spoke, but the voice didn't speak to him. Listen, please. No one knew who he was except John. 
when you submit to authority and you get under authority, the people who don't know you, God will tell them who you are. You don't understand. The voice says what? This is my beloved son. Hear him. I am pleased. He was talking to the crowd. Write this down. When you submit, you don't need to promote yourself. God promotes you when you submit. He promotes you himself. This week, my face is seen by 1.3 billion people every week. And I never asked to be exposed. I have never ever invited myself anywhere. I have never handed out a card or a brochure to be invited to anywhere to preach. Never! This year, 697 invitations and I never asked for one. When he submitted, God promoted. The third thing that happened when he fell down, the Bible says the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. Ladies and gentlemen, he was the Holy Spirit. So now we confused, eh? He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So what is this? Is there two different anointings? Yes. There's one that you receive when you get born again. There's one you can't get until you submit to authority. <laughs> this is heavy. Everybody say authority. Can you imagine the anointing coming on God? Makes no sense. God is God. Yeah, but God says, look, there's an anointing I need that John has the key to. Because <laughs> I gave John the key. I gave John authority. If I get under John, I'll have my anointing and the anointing I'm supposed to have for the work. And finally, number four, the Bible says, Immediately, the Holy Spirit led him to be tempted. Write this down. You are not qualified to face the devil until you are under authority. <sighs> Listen. If you study all the pastors and leaders who fell, study them carefully, all of them in the church. You study them. This is their problem. That's why their marriages fall apart. Their homes corrupt, are destroyed. That's why they end up in all kinds of sexual immorality. You can't go out there and face the devil unless you are under someone's authority. The devil wants you to come by yourself. Notice the devil's first temptation. The first one was appetites. Humans got three appetites. Write them down. Food, water, and sex. And if you ain't under authority, you are finished already. The devil's going to wipe you out. I know it's quiet <laughs> because you have just woken up to one of your big problems. Well, I, I, the, 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 the Lord called me and the Lord told me. Shh, shh, shh. <laughs> Who's your pastor? The Lord sent me out. The Lord, God told me, God, who's your pastor?
Who do I, who do I call to check to see if you are legitimate? Let me close. They asked him, by what authority do you do these things? He didn't say God. He said who? John. Jesus loved his pastor. You know, I like the way Greg speaks about Papa Cirillo all the time. That's the key to your success, son. Huh? Keep bragging on him. I would never know you if I didn't come to see him. An authority can take 10 years and make it 10 seconds. I mean, Jesus, before John, he has no ministry, he has no followers, he has nobody. But he, he recognizes the guy who got all of them. The Bible says there were so many people following John, ready for this? It says the whole of Judea went out to see the guy. Stay with me, please, don't listen. Okay, he said, in other words, John had the biggest meetings in town. It says all of Judea went out to see John, even the Pharisees and scribes. The guy had thousands at his meeting. And Jesus says, hey, hey, that's smart. Instead of getting jealous of him, I'm going to what? Submit. Why? Write this down. Whoever you submit to, you become greater than. Remember that. He fell at his feet. In one day, John said, he had all these disciples, he said, and the Bible says, and John said to the disciples, there's one greater than I now. Don't follow me anymore. He turned his entire ministry over to the guy who submitted the lowest. Oh, this is too much. Papa Cirillo is not here. He's resting. He's a little up in age. So he trusts these people with you. Why? He knows you submitted. Never give power to someone who's not submitted. Power without authority is illegitimate power. And John turned his entire school over to Jesus in one second. He worked 30 years to build the school. And Christ got it in 30 seconds. Wow. Finally, they asked Jesus, by what authority do you do these things? And Jesus said, my pastor. He said, what? My pastor. And then he begins to brag. He says, what did you all go to see? My pastor. He wasn't dressed in fine clothing, you know. He wasn't dressed in linen. Watch him now. He said, but my pastor? My pastor is the best pastor in the world, he says. Watch him. He says, there's not been any prophet greater than my pastor. No man born of woman is greater than John, my pastor. I, do you brag on your pastor? You know why I'm proud of you partners of this ministry? Some of you have been wondering about why Dr. Cirillo a few years ago had that big cloak that 
that mantle, he called it a mantle. Do you know what he was saying? Stay under me. Just like Elijah submitted to Elijah. When I leave, every partner gonna get the cloak. And you're gonna do greater works than he ever did in his lifetime. That anointing is coming on you today. 40 years as a generation. This is the beginning of transfer of the authority of this ministry to the partners. Your work is going to multiply. It's going to explode. What you've been doing in your ministry is about to expand. Because 40 years means he's going to bring the release of that power upon you. And the authority is going to explode. Give God a praise today that the authority of this ministry is coming upon you. Stand up on your feet, every partner. Lift your hand in the air for a minute. First, I want you to repent. Repent about your attitude toward authority. Ask God to forgive you for being afraid to submit completely. Ask him to show you legitimate authority to submit to. True authority can be identified by very important criteria. Keep your hands up, please. How do you know someone is a true authority? Number one, they don't do anything to you for their benefit. <laughs> they always want to make you better. They always want to promote your life. They want to see you successful. They don't use you for their success. A true authority makes you bigger than they are. Secondly, a true authority will never abuse you. Thirdly, a true authority will never misguide you. True authority. 60 years of ministry and Brother Cirillo is still going. Never heard about one immoral act from his life. Come on, lift your hands and worship God for a leader. Authority has been tested. You never heard a question about misappropriation of funds in this ministry. He doesn't use you. He serves you. He wants you to be better. He wants to promote your success. Give God a hand for a true authority. Your submission is your key to greatness. The fastest way to the top is on your knees. Get under somebody. Every time a great leader falls and I speak with them, my first question is, who's your covering? How can this happen with no one knowing? Your anointing is useless without authority. Suffer it to so, to be so for now, to fulfill all righteousness. Lift your hands and just say it. I surrender all. I want you to sing that song. Surrender first to the King of Kings. And surrender to the authority God put in your life. It might be a pastor that you are under in a church. It might be an overseer in your ministry it might be a group of people that you chose to submit to to watch your life and protect you from evil ask God to give you the spirit of submission and surrender 
I want you to lift your voice right now. Today, 211 is a new beginning. All to Jesus I surrender all to him. I will ever love. Trust him in his presence. Daily live. Come on, lift your voice and sing it out loud. I surrender. Submission is the key to power. Let's hold hands together for and a prayer of agreement. Brother Greg is going to come and direct us after this prayer. Hold that hand. Tell your neighbor, I need you. You need me. I submit to your gift. Keep holding hands, please. A lady said to me the other day, she said, Dr. Monroe, if you were sick, and the only person who could operate on you was a Muslim. Would you go to that doctor? I said, absolutely yes. Because I ain't going to his religion. I'm going to his gift. <laughs> you can only be protected when you submit to the authority. The person you're touching has a gift and you can never receive from that gift if you don't submit to that person so the Bible says submit ye one to another I want you to go back home and repent to your pastor some of you in ministry let this be the year you find some people who you're gonna be covered by submit to them and tell them watch my life and rebuke me if I'm going wrong and, and I'm gonna be able to talk to you and, and I want you to call my wife and see how, how I'm doing there are people in my life who can call my wife and check on me without calling me are you protected are there people in your life who can come in and say sir your sermon is questionable check it I've got people in my life over me who can sit me down in the church and tell me you can't preach for a year because of your behavior. Are you under authority? The anointing never cancels authority. It needs authority to be legitimate. Maybe the reason why your ministry is not growing is because you're not under authority. John says, his work shall exceed mine. Dr. All Roberts was one of my most awesome authorities. I used to carry his Bible. <laughs> I used to clean his shoes. I used to take him water. I used to watch him. I just watch him to make sure I could outthink him to see what he needs next. Whatever he told me, I never questioned it. I just did it. And one day he called me in his office. He said, Come and see me, son. After five years serving him, I walked into his office in Tulsa. And I knelt on that white rug. He said, knelt down, kneel down, son. And he put his hands on me. He said, son, 
you have served me. Now the Lord will give you more than I ever had. And he transferred his anointing to my life. I have been to countries he's never been to. He has never in his life advised governments. I am advising governments all over the world. He said, your ministry shall exceed mine because you submitted to me. Today, because you came to this ministry, what they did in 60 years, God's going to transfer to you in 60 days. God is that powerful because of your submission. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, let this word be the standard for our year. Teach us to respect and submit to legitimate authority. Lord, give us spiritual discernment to recognize true authority, to find them, to go and look for them just like Jesus did. He went looking for John. Help us to look for people we can submit to and ask them to watch over our lives so we can have our power released. So you can promote us. So we can face the devil without fear because we are protected. Sanctify this people. And thank you for a new beginning. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Friends, I'm going to come and check on you in a couple of months. Yeah. The authority in this building right now is Greg, Pastor Greg Morrow. That means you don't move until he say move. That's called submission to authority. Uh, during the break, I promised a few people I would be out in the lobby to autograph these books, these new books. If you'd like for me to do that, I'll meet you outside in the lobby. I'd love to shake hands with you and bless you. And I, I look forward to seeing you on the other side of authority. I love you. God bless you. Stay submitted. <laughs>